Uh, good morning. Um, thank you for having me here today. And uh, like Rick said, the really, I've kind of prepared a general overview uh, for you guys, um, and and I'm thinking that it may be. Uh, if, you, if there are specific areas that anyone would like to discuss, I don't mind uh, doing that. So feel free as I go through the presentation, um, ask questions. Let me know if there are any areas you'd like for me to comment on or discuss. Uh, I don't mind doing that. I am, I've been with the FBI for uh, about 21 years. Uh, I've been here in Australia for a year and a half. Uh, my background is uh, I was a, a, an attorney, a prosecutor before I joined the FBI and then um, I had an undergraduate degree in computer science, so when the FBI started getting into the cyber arena, uh, I was chosen to actually start up the first cyber squad in San Diego division in 1996, and I've been working cyber crime ever since. So uh, here in Australia, I operate the cyber portfolio, so I deal with not only Australia, but uh, New Zealand and all the other island nations in the South Pacific. Um, so if there are any questions about anything as I go through it, by all means, I want to keep this a little bit informal and, and it's a general overview, so ask questions if you have them, okay? And like I said, it's going to be pretty low tech, so I'm not going to dig real deep into the weeds. As long as you know this is a computer, that you know how to turn it on, the power button, and this is a place for your CD-ROM and not to hold your coffee, you should be good. You'd be right. That's what you're supposed to say in Australia, right? This is what I'm going to talk about a little bit. So I'll introduce you to the Legal Attaché program, just as a uh, background, what I do here and our roles and responsibilities just very quickly. I'll go over our definition of a cybercrime in the FBI because different jurisdictions have different definitions. So I'll tell you what we consider to be cybercrime presently, which is, again, a fluid definition, always changing. Uh, I'll go into a, a few of our initiatives for the 21st century and how we're uh, rolling into the 21st century, and then I'll start going through the violations of cybercrime. Online child exploitation, internet fraud, identity theft, intellectual property rights, copyright infringements, and then uh, malicious computer code, hacking type incidents, and then our technologies, wireless technology, which is a big thing right now, and then international initiatives. I'll finish up on just a, a few things that we're uh, working with our foreign partners. As far as the, the LEGAT program, Legal Attaché program goes, established in 1940 by U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt, and in 1941, our first agent was assigned to Bogota, Colombia to counter the Nazi threat. So we're working in an undercover capacity initially, and you can see it, it developed there over the next few years to where we had quite a few agents serving all over the country, and the State the Department of State, the U.S. Department of State, gave us the title of Legal Attachés because we were working in an undercover capacity mainly intelligence gathering in the, the war period. Uh, and in 1947, the National Security Act was created and the U.S. intelligence community, also referred to as the USIC, was developed and the FBI is a, a partner in the USIC and we're also responsible for all international criminal matters. So here having the cyber portfolio, I kind of straddle the fence because uh, we divide up uh, our priorities or our responsibilities by program, and the cyber program is the only one that is a little bit of a hybrid. So I not only handle the criminal aspect of it, but also the intelligence aspect of it, which means that I deal with uh, all the AFP on the criminal side and all of the state and territory law enforcement agencies, as well as the intelligence agencies like uh, ASIO and New Zealand SIS. So I, I kind of work both aspects of it. LEGAT mission, and of course you can read that yourself, but it basically, like I said, our responsibility is to uh, create liaison with our foreign law enforcement and, and intelligence partners, and also to bridge the gap with government agencies to share information, share intelligence, and work joint operations. So that's, that's in a nutshell what we're doing in foreign countries. And I don't have law enforcement powers in a foreign country, of course, so after 20 years of, of carrying a gun every day of my life. I'm here and I don't have to worry about keeping up with that thing, so it's kind of nice, a little bit liberating. These are where our offices are. You can see we have 75 uh, offices in our footprint, um, about 200 countries, territories, and islands, so all over the world. We're in the Asia region, and uh, we have a, a very large area of responsibility here in Australia in that we cover Australia, New Zealand, and all the South Pacific Islands. 
whereas there are, uh, especially let's say in Europe, there are quite a few offices that are close together and they just have their country as their responsibility. So we have a huge area of responsibility. I travel a lot, I meet with a lot of people and I discuss a lot of issues and we, we exchange information quite a bit back and forth. Again, our area of responsibility, I kind of mentioned this, but you can see these are all of the countries that we cover. Some uh, hardship spots there, of course. I don't get a lot of sympathy from my counterparts in Baghdad and Islamabad. But. Okay, so that's a little bit about the legal attache office, probably more than you want to know. And this, these are our priorities in the FBI. And uh, as you can see, as you would suspect, counterterrorism is our number one priority. Counterintelligence, number two. Cyber, number three. And again, this is kind of a sliding scale because, as a matter of fact, the, uh, our director, who is uh, Robert Mueller, has made some comments recently that uh, he suspects that cyber will move up in the priority chain. And uh, on any given day, depending on what's going on, who's attacking what government agency, cyber could be the number one priority. So. Uh, it is kind of a sliding scale, and uh, cyber is definitely on everybody's radar. What is cybercrime? I kind of touched on this when I was talking about the violations, but and these are in order of priority. Illegal computer intrusions, our counterterrorism, counterintelligence, and criminal computer intrusions. Those are our top priority. Uh, and then we go to online child exploitation, intellectual property rights, which are counterfeit software, uh, any, any type of copyright infringement, and then internet fraud and identity theft. All right, and I'll talk a little bit more about the violations uh, in just a minute. As far as the 21st century, uh, a few of the initiatives that the FBI is involved with, just like every other social networking person out there, FBI has a Facebook page you can like and follow along. You can uh, get tweets from the FBI National Press Office. FBI posts YouTube videos. There's an app for that. <laughs> FBI has an app, and we've just come out with this. This was August of last year. This is the, uh, and this is, has to do, of course, with our online child safety uh, initiative. We have the FBI Child ID app. And what this app is, it's an app that is freely downloadable on the iPhone and it stores information about your children and it gives you contact information, safety tips, etc. And it, it's just, it's a preparation type tool. And so if anything happens to your children, if somebody goes missing, and you have all of that at your fingertips, you have pictures that you can disseminate immediately, get it out to law enforcement for quick action um, and that type. So it's a, and uh, we're talking about sharing this with our, our other foreign partners. So um, that may be coming up in the near future. Uh, these are electronic billboards. You don't see a lot of these in Australia, but in the U.S., um, pretty common, especially in New York. You'll have these huge billboards that can scroll through different messages. We post our, our most wanted fugitives on these billboards. Also, if there is a child abduction, then this information can not only be posted on the digital bill, billboards, but also on highway electronic signs. And so, you know, to be on the lookout for a, a white Ford sedan with license plate so-and-so. And, -so. and uh, we've actually uh, recovered quite a few of abducted children that way, where somebody's driving down the interstate or the, the highway, and they see this vehicle, and they contact law enforcement, and we're able to uh, grab the bad guy. Even in uh, role-playing games, this is a, a screenshot from Second Life. You can be walking around in your virtual world and come across the FBI's top 10 most wanted fugitives. So we're, we're not missing out on any tricks. Okay, so the things that we're dealing with. We have, and this is just a, a, a small snippet of the, the different things that, that we are, are seeing quite a bit. Social engineering, uh, phishing emails type things, phishing or farming or smishing or whatever, you know, vishing. Uh, twist you want to put on it. Uh, denial of service attacks and DDoS, distributed denial of service attacks. That's kind of the big thing right now and they, they run in conjunction with the botnets, these huge networks that are created and people are unwillingly uh, acting as zombies 
where their, their computer's been infected and they're tasked with attacking a specific site and they don't even know it. So it's using distributed computing power to uh, really open up a, a huge attack against a particular individual. Scanning attacks, uh, and these are our commercial tools. Uh, scanning attack you can think of is it, it's really it's a scan of all the open ports on a network. So it's like uh, if somebody walks down the street and checks every door to see if it's open, not necessarily a criminal activity. However, it's usually the precursor to something bad that they're going to do. So they're checking for open ports, and if they find an open port, they know uh, what's running on that port typically, and they can find an exploit for that particular service on the port. Web exploits and spoofs, just like what they sound like, looking for different uh, vulnerabilities in operating systems and spoofing IP addresses, even caller ID. So it looks like the, the fraudster is coming from somewhere that he's not. Uh, and then you get into the malicious uh, computer code, viruses, worms, trojans, these types of things, which I'll go into a little more detail. And then internal threats. So usually uh, when I was in the, in the field and working investigative matters, if we came across a, a case where it was a very complicated intrusion, uh, the first thing that we would do is look internally because a lot of times it's somebody with inside information or with an inside track. So uh, a lot of times there is some type of nexus between an employee, disgruntled employee, something like that. Best way to deal with most of these, anybody can see that at the bottom, it might be a little bit in your way. I need to move a little bit, is everybody okay? Um, best way to deal with most of these issues, education. So. I, when I was in uh, the U.S., I made quite a few presentations. Even here, I present at a lot of conferences. We try to get information out to the general public as much as we can. We have a few initiatives that, that I'll explain to you where we are, are very interested in that. And I think the rest of the world is starting to follow along uh, with that tactic of actually informing the general public because, you know, that's half the battle. How do we educate? Uh, this, we have our, our specific unit that is dedicated to investigating our cyber investigators, not only in the U.S., but worldwide. Um, we have 56 FBI field offices, uh, a little over 400 satellite offices we call resident agencies. Every one of these field offices has dedicated cyber personnel. We, we call putting them in a career path. And uh, when an agent is hired, he is placed into a cyber career path if he has certain technical skills and then he goes through a training program which is up to six years of the, the, the curriculum that we have developed going through uh, different classes. Over 30 classes that uh, there are and, and you know that kind of uh, goes back and forth um, but it, we include FBI specialized instruction for FBI specific techniques and then also advanced techniques which are dealing with just uh, special commercial expertise. We, have, we hire contractors with uh, state-of-the-art information who train on specific things like uh, malware analysis where you really get into uh, the, the technical side of investigating uh, certain logs and different things like that. So it can be uh, fairly comprehensive. Um, I'm actually, uh, we try to do international training. When I was uh, at headquarters and I was working on the, some of these curriculum for these courses and teaching some of these courses, we developed a program to teach all of our legal attaches. And I traveled all around the world and provided basic cybercrime investigative uh, training for all of the legal attaches all over the world. So we have specific cyber in, in certain areas, especially our Five Eyes countries. We have certain uh, assistant legal attaches like myself who are dedicated to cyber. We even have our, our cyber division who will supplement the legal attache program and put a cyber investigator in certain offices where we have a lot of work. So it's very high on our priority list. We also have a program called InfraGuard. And I think uh, I was just meeting with um, the Brits and they've come up with a program very similar to InfraGuard. And uh, I think they're, they're developing a similar type activity in Australia. But uh, it's a public-private alliance where uh, we, not just the FBI, but other government agencies are joining up and combining efforts with uh, not only local law enforcement, but private industry to share information. Because we realize that we're not going to win this battle just purely from a law enforcement perspective. Private industry is seeing a, a lot more and a lot different activity than we see in law enforcement. 
And so uh, when we get together with, we have different chapters in every division of the FBI, and they're responsible for identifying their local infrastructures and having representatives from these different infrastructures present at these meetings, and we share information. We have also developed a program where uh, these different uh, private companies can report information to the FBI, and then we sanitize the report because a lot of times they're concerned with saying, you know, um, IBM was hacked because of this vulnerability. And so we don't do that. So they, they give us a report and we sanitize it and take out all of the, the personal information for the specific company. And then we share that with everybody else, say, you know, be on the lookout for this particular attack because it could make your uh, information vulnerable. And so they don't have to worry about it being attributed to a specific company. So it's been a very successful program. Uh, we've actually initiated big cases when uh, we've received information from private companies and we work very closely together with the companies uh, to resolve the cases. Now going to some of the uh, programs, the violations. Uh, Innocent Images is the largest FBI undercover operation ever undertaken. And so you've probably you know, seen the shows on television that, that are dealing with um, like a uh, a honeypot type situation where you have an FBI agent or law enforcement pretending to be a child online. And so they're acting in an undercover capacity and then they catch online predators. Um, and so that's what Innocent Images is. Uh, we have law enforcement agencies all over the world participating with us in this program. Uh, a very interesting quote here from this journalist some time ago, where men are men, the internet, where men are men, women are men, and children are FBI agents. So I thought that was kind of witty. And if you can't see the cartoon here, it says, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. So you never really know who you're talking to on the internet. But uh, we do have a program where we have international partners that we train, and they actually travel back to Washington, D.C., and work side by side with our investigators, so we're working uh, in a, a joint operations and we have consistent protocols. And so these are the countries that are participating in this and there actually may have be a, a few more that, I have, that have been added lately that I don't have up here, but of course all of the Five Eyes countries participate in this. Uh, we have, it's very active. We have a, a meeting somewhere in the world every year where all of these people come together and we discuss uh, joint cases and joint techniques for investigation. And like I said, I'm kind of going quickly, so if you have questions or you want to talk about anything, just let me know. Internet fraud. We have developed a uh, partnership with our National White Collar Crime Center um, to come up with the IC3, the Internet Crime Complaint Center. It's a joint operation between the FBI and the National White Collar Crime Center. And uh, what they do is uh, it's an online forum for collecting complaints from citizens, and they will collect these, develop leads uh, for investigation, and then they refer these out to law enforcement all over the world. Even if there is, it looks like a subject is in Australia, uh, they will send the information to me to disseminate to Australian law enforcement. So, uh, and what this is really good for is if we have somebody who is, let's say, the victim of auction fraud, they buy a camera online and they don't receive their camera. I get a call and they say, I want this person thrown in jail. I didn't receive my $50 camera. The FBI isn't going to open up an investigation on that. We just we don't have the resources and, and we can't address every one of these complaints. However, if, they refer the, if we refer this to the IC3 and they file an online complaint and we determine that this individual, the bad guy, is doing this all over the world and there are thousands of complainants, then we can aggregate these complaints and then disseminate the, those to the specific law enforcement agency uh, for investigation. So it's a great tool for us to address uh, big issues that are occurring all over the world. They also analyze trends and, and they work with law enforcement, uh, partner with our law enforcement officers and private industry all over the country. This is just a, a snapshot of their website. There's a, a button down here, file a complaint. You click on that and it gives anyone in the world can go here and file an online complaint. And we do, we get them from all over the world and uh, we can action those, those complaints. Fill out the information, Every, you know, the person, the complainant feels like they're doing something because they're reporting it and it will be, you know, we tell them up front, may not be able to investigate this, but if we can, we will. So it, it's a way to get all the information into the system in case it's, it's recurring. 
We also partner with these agencies on this specific site, LooksTooGoodToBeTrue.com. There are law enforcement agencies and different private industry companies. You can see U.S. Uh, Postal Inspection Service, that's the U.S. Uh, Post, uh, Monster.com, uh, different, the, the Fraud Group, NCFTA, Target, Citigroup, Semantic. So all of these different companies participate with us in this site. And it's a, a great website, especially if you're, it's like, um, what's the, uh, the website to go and, and check out urban myths type thing. So you can catch up on what the latest scams are on this site. Uh, you can check out if you've received a curious email, if it's actually a scam or if it's something that uh, you can rely on, um, this type of thing. So there's a, very good tips, uh, very good information, up-to-date information. This is what the, the website uh, looks like or did not too long ago. Um, you can see the different types of information regarding hacking, identity theft, phishing, spam, spyware, all these different topics. So just an area where you can get a lot of good information. And we try to publicize this as much as we can. Identity theft, in, and this was in 2010, uh, the, they took, there was a survey taken by the U.S. Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, and they ranked identity theft as the top consumer complaint for the year. So it is a growing problem. We realize it's a going prob growing problem. Um, and, and I've actually, uh, it's probably the most common area I'm asked to speak on since I've been in Australia over the past year. So it, it, it's a problem in Australia and it's an issue that everybody is addressing. Different places uh, where there is personal, personally identifiable information, PII, all of these places. So all of these places are targets um, for this type of activity. And, and of course you can read that and see everything. It's, it's what you would expect. Um, all these places because that's where people store information and it's where information uh, can be uh, accessed by individuals. Um, whereas you have all of the uh, technology enabled identity theft, we are still uh, receiving information and everything that, that we're uh, putting together that, that the uh, traditional techniques like dumpster diving, stolen mail, uh, purse stealing, uh, credit card access, these types of things are still the areas where we're seeing most of the identity theft. So even though you're seeing the technology-enabled ID theft really stepping up, it's the traditional crimes that are still uh, most of the problem. Skimming devices. In the U.S., we don't have the chip and pin credit cards. So everything, we're still relying on the magnetic strip. So skimming is still a big issue for us. And I, I know here, they still, the uh, on your chip and pin credit cards, the backup is to have the magnetic strip too, so uh, you can use them either way. But we have these skim skimming devices which are, are easily able to capture the magnetic data on the, on the strip and then create a new credit card. So uh, I used to get questions all the time about people who were afraid to purchase things online. And I said, you know, it's pretty secure these days. It's not, it's just like going out to a restaurant handing your credit card to the 21-year-old waiter who can go in the back and skim your credit card and take all the information off of it, create a new card. So um, it's something to, to watch out for. Keystroke capture devices, both hardware and software uh, types. You can see here the, the difference if you're not looking for it. And keystroke capture is probably the deadliest way to steal information because Physical access to a computer where you can grab keystroke or monitor the keystrokes um, is deadly because you can't do anything to prevent it. Even if uh, you're using encryption, they're grabbing this information before you encrypt it because they're monitoring your, your keystrokes. So uh, it's a, a particularly devious way. Uh, this ATM skimming is a big problem in Australia. This uh, is just an example of an actual case. You can look at this ATM machine and it looks like a regular ATM machine. There's a, a false faceplate. I mean, your first clue is this faceplate here that, that's kind of over the sticker. So if you see anything like that that looks out of the ordinary on an ATM machine, don't use it. Because uh, this actually has a false faceplate that is placed over and it actually works. You stick your card in it and it gives you money, whatever. Uh, but it just grabs your, your uh, ATM card information as you stick it in there. And then you're worried about, uh, well, what about the pin that I put in? This is why people tell you to always cover your hand when you're plugging in your pin. 
And it's not just for people looking over your shoulders, but in this particular case, this pamphlet holder had a camera in it that was capturing your, your keystrokes as you typed in your pen. So if you're not covering it there, then it, it can uh, capture uh, your keystrokes as you're typing in your pen. And it had a, a wireless antenna and a battery, so actually could be harvested as the person just gets close to it, grabs all the information off of it, and removes his faceplate that has your, your uh, ATM card data in it, and can combine the two and create new ATM cards, clean out your account. Another uh, example of it's not really maybe technical expertise that uh, will do you in. This was uh, Sarah Palin, governor of Alaska, when she was running for president. And uh, this was a few years ago, about five years ago, four or five years ago. Her, you may have seen it in the news, her email was hacked. And the way that this gentleman hacked her email, you know, when you're a, a public official, you're, you know, a, a, a public identity like that, you can find information about these people everywhere. This guy, it really didn't have any technical expertise. He just changed her password to her email. He knew what her email was. He went into her email account and went through the lost password feature and just answered some security questions by information he got on the internet. He answered questions, uh, it says down here at the bottom, Palin hack really didn't require any real skill. Instead, the hacker simply reset her password using her birth date, zip code, information about where she met her spouse, the security questions on her Yahoo account. And that's how he got access to her email. IPR, intellectual property rights, uh, what we're talking about here is not necessarily the DVD that you buy or the book that you read, um, but it's somebody's intangible idea that's put into that media. So that's actually what is valuable. These are some of the international treaties that deal with intellectual property rights. And uh, you, there are a lot of people that are very important and have a lot of money that are interested in this. You know, the, Motion Picture Association, the recording industry, uh, Microsoft, all these people. So uh, they have very strong lobbies in, well, all over the world, not just in the U.S. So there are all of these treaties that are, are uh, agreements between different countries. I'll go over each one of these in detail. Just kidding. <laughs> see if you're awake. No, but you can see that it is a very important issue worldwide. As you may have seen in the news, the mega upload case, do you remember this just a few weeks, months ago? Um, this was Kim.com, the guy, and I was actually over in Auckland for the arrest. And uh, this individual was running megaupload.com, and there were a bunch of different mega sites there, you know, mega cars, mega cash, mega porn, mega music, all these different things. And he was providing illegal uh, downloads to copyrighted material. So a huge case worldwide. We initiated the takedown over nine countries simultaneously. So of course they were going all hours uh, of the night and day. Uh, this was the Crisco Mansion in Auckland. That's where he lived. He actually is there right now waiting to be extradited to the U.S. Um, this is us taking away his 18 luxury vehicles at his house. <laughs> so there were two Rolls Royces worth over $700,000 each. Maybe he had some neat cars. So um, this is, it's a big problem across the world. And this, his site, megaupload.com, was actually uh, responsible for 4% of all Internet traffic. So if you're noticing the Internet running quicker now, it's because he's not there anymore. <laughs> so it, it's a huge initiative worldwide. Okay, the, uh, the malicious stuff, malicious code, malicious software, viruses, etc. Difference between malicious code is how it propagates. So you have a Trojan, also known as a remote administration tool or a remote access tool. Usually you have to do something to infect yourself with a Trojan, um, but uh, you, not necessarily. You can go to certain websites and be infected, but usually you have to do something. You have to, to not be on your guard to infect yourself with a Trojan. Um, a virus, just like its biological counterpart, has to be carried from host to host. So if I have a cold and I go over here and sneeze on Rick, then I give him germs and he shakes hand with somebody else, and that's how it's passed. So that's how a virus uh, tra is transmitted, usually via email. Really more generically, uh, we call things viruses, but more of what we see these days are worms that actually just seek out network connections and spread, just propagate across the internet. Uh, it's mainly what we're seeing these days. 
And, and I have down here at the bottom, what about polymorphic code and zero day exploits? These are the things that keep all security uh, managers awake at night. You've got polymorphic code which changes as it propagates and that, that is to, uh, of course, avoid all the antivirus programs because the antivirus will pick out parts of the code and define its, uh, its well, definition for that virus by parts of the code and that's how it picks up on antivirus uh, and, and finds these things when they're on your system. So if the code is changing as it propagates, the, the virus definition is not changing so it's like a new uh, virus every time it changes. So very difficult to find these kind of things. Zero day exploits are exploits that have actually been released to the wild and nobody's seen them before. So there are a few days when something is first released when all of the antivirus companies don't have it in their code. That's why you do the updates. You've got to do the updates. Um, so zero day exploits are something that are, is, is very harsh. It's very hard to defend against and it's something that we're always looking for. This is a, uh, the control panel for an older Trojan called Netbus. And you can see here, if, if I infect you with a Trojan, it's just like I'm sitting at your, I have remote access, just like I'm sitting at the keyboard. And I can do anything. I can make your um, CD uh, drive open and close. I can uh, show images, make images pop up on your computer, send you messages. Uh, I can, of course, see what you're doing. I can um, activate your microphone and listen to what's going on. If you have a webcam, I can activate your camera and watch whatever it's pointing at, which is why I'm always uh, preaching to my teenage girls. They have no reason for a webcam on their computer because you never know who's going to be able to access that. Um, so you can do all of these things and, of course, go through their computer and uh, keep it as a uh, botnet, as a what we call a zombie. Uh, to attack other people, if that's your knowledge. It was interesting, a few years ago, we found that uh, these guys that were creating these Trojans or, or using these Trojans, would they thought it was funny to take victim screenshots and trade these, like trading cards, and see who could come up with the best victim. It was like a prestige thing. And so uh, we found some of these floating around on the Internet, and you can see this one. This is a, a victim's computer who's infected with a Trojan, doesn't know it, and this is his uh, wallpaper. You can see him and his girlfriend, wife, uh, partner. And bad guy sends him this pop-up message. Hi, I know we haven't talked before. This is your computer. Since I see everything in your room, thought I'd throw you a few pointers. First, put on a shirt, please. Second, you've got a nice girl there on your bed, and you're sitting here on the computer looking like a goon. Come on. This is the webcam shot of him reading that message. <laughs> So they put these two together, and this was one of the most popular things floating around the internet. This guy got a lot of credibility by getting these, these shots. Okay, when you're talking about wireless, uh, these are just, of course, everybody I'm sure is familiar with these things, access points or wireless access points. Your encryption is WEP or WPA. If you have a choice and you know the difference, you always want to use WPA, WPA2 rather than WEP. WEP is very easily cracked and it's not very secure and it, it's easy to get into your network. It's better than nothing, but it's not as good as WPA. And then uh, you know what Wi-Fi is, WiMAX, microwave uh, access interoperability. And it, it's a way to create a uh, single transmission to a, a lot of receivers so you can have wireless access in a, a big large area like a small town or a community. Uh, these are some photos. A guy in Minnesota in the U.S. sent this to me because he's driving down the interstate and he sees that somebody has hacked into the highway signs and is changing them as they go. So they're putting up all of these funny signs. Of course you can imagine what kind of chaos he can create. It, you know, he puts up, the, you know, a, a nuclear device has been discovered in the governor's mansion or something. So, a, a phenomenon <laughs> in Texas, and this is still going on, there's somebody who is obsessed with zombies, <laughs> and he goes around changing these road construction signs all the time, and, and some of them are pretty funny, and we're still seeing these today, and he'll have things like uh, zombie prostitutes ahead and things like that. <laughs> so, they're actually, they're pretty funny, but... This is just an example of war biking, a guy riding around on his bike and he has a GPS on his handlebars 
to plot out where he finds open networks. And you're seeing more and more secure wireless networks now. When, when I first started talking about this stuff, almost every wireless network was wide open because it comes that way by default. Now people are realizing that they've got to lock down their networks a little bit, so more people are using uh, the encryption, which is good. But you still find open networks. So I remember the first time I came to Australia for work was in 2005. And the whole time I was here traveling all over, I, I, had, I was able to, I had a long range wireless card and I was able to find, and I didn't do anything bad, no, don't arrest me or anything, but I was able to get you know, free internet everywhere I went because I could find an open wireless network somewhere and just you know, squat on somebody else's internet connection. So you've got his uh, GPS here, his uh, wireless antenna on the back of his bike, and then, uh, well, I missed the picture there, but he had saddlebags on the side of his uh, bicycle where he had his computer, and he could drive around and find open wireless networks. And once he finds an open network, he can connect to it and do whatever he's gonna do, hack the Pentagon or trade child pornography or send out all of his spam or whatever. And then if we're investigating that, whose door are we going to kick in? I mean, we don't know it's this kid, but the, you know, the, the person who wasn't, uh, didn't have their network locked down. So, because that's the IP address it's coming back to. The same thing here. We, we, this was in uh, the Washington DC area. We saw this, uh, bless you, computer virus. <laughs> this uh, antenna in the window. And uh, again, this person is infringing on somebody else's network. So they're grabbing somebody else's uh, internet connection through their, their network that is not secured and doing, you know, either getting free internet access or doing something bad. So again, if we're, they're doing something bad and we're busting down a door, it's not this guy who's going to get in trouble, but his neighbor who is totally unsuspecting that somebody is infringing on her network. You find these commercial antennas, which are rather expensive, that you can purchase, and they, they um, mold the signal for different ways that you can get access to networks. Uh, some of them fairly expensive. However, you can get plans on the internet to make your own <laughs> antenna. Pringles cans, very common because of their shape. I understand Spicy Cajun, a particularly good receiver. <laughs> now these, uh, you know, the FBI, uh, training program is six months for a new agent and they train us as we go through this on things like this. If you see a guy in a park with a Pringles can on a tripod, that's called a clue. <laughs> Something is going on here. So these guys are scanning around trying to find open wireless networks. Real problem for us, WiMAX, like in this particular article on CNN.com, they're talking about making the, the mall in Washington DC, which is the large area in between the monuments, uh, free internet, free wireless internet. And you know, there are thousands of people out there a day that could be doing anything. And you know, hacking into the Pentagon or trading child pornography, whatever. And unless we're walking by and looking over their shoulder, we can't trace it back to this person because it's free open wireless network. So that's a problem for law enforcement. This, again, uh, that I, I pilfered from CNN.com, but it's very good advice as far as securing a wireless network. They come with a default SSID, your security set identifier, or ESID, and that's the name of your network. Everybody knows what hardware comes with what default name. So it's a good idea to change your SSID. You also want to uh, disable broadcasting your SSID, because if you're broadcasting your SSID, it's just saying, I'm here. So if you scan for networks, and it pops up, you've got, you know, Linksys, um, whatever, uh, Wi-Fi, this, whatever. So you know those networks are there, so you can try to get into them. So if you're not broadcasting it, they don't pop up, and you just have to know that network name. Um, and these are simple things to do. Enabling your encryption, WEP or WPA, we already talked about that. Uh, also, if you're extremely paranoid, you can enable MAC address filtering at your media access control so you only allow certain people to access your network and you know exactly what their network card ID is and so nobody else can get access. Finally, uh, our international initiatives. This is a very good program that I became aware of since I've been here in Australia. The Internet Industry Association in conjunction with BCDE has come up with the iCode initiative and it's actually a code of conduct that service providers uh, are to follow to make their customers secure. 
And uh, you can see down here at four main elements, a notification management system for compromised computers on their network, the ISP's network, standardized information resource for end users, so it gives them information on how to protect their networks, um, it gives the latest threat information, and then a reporting mechanism for uh, compromises. And so it's a very good program. It's gaining a lot of traction in Australia as well as throughout the world. The uh, IIA actually uh, went to uh, Washington, D.C. and briefed this program to the U.S. government, and the U.S. is on the road to a similar initiative of uh, actually encouraging Internet service providers. Of course, there are quite a few in the U.S., so it hasn't been mandated, but uh, there's uh, a big push to encourage service providers to provide certain degrees of security for their users and offering incentives to do so. So it's a little bit of a, a twist on the I code, but similar type information. And then finally, the uh, Council of Europe Convention, which is, uh, of course, a worldwide initiative to create international cyber uh, legislation. It's really the first time that we have seen uh, a, an agreement throughout the world to try and create international uh, legislation. And so it's a way that we will be able to investigate and prosecute cyber criminals throughout the world uh, without any concern for where they are. Because, you know, as you know, there are no geographic boundaries to cyberspace. So it's a smart move. Uh, there are quite a few countries who have ratified it. Australia has just passed legislation in attempts to ratify it. Hopefully it will be soon and uh, we'll all be on the same page and be able to investigate cyber criminals throughout the world.